well, fellow IITians, um, it is really wonderful to be amongst you today to see that the Pan-IIT movement has truly blossomed in the Bay Area. Just like in so many fields of human endeavor, the Bay Area for Pan-IIT is at the leading edge and a true innovator, unsurpassed in terms of really engagement of volunteers, of helping each other, helping fellow IITians. I'm really delighted to be back here after an absence of six years. Monishi, thanks for your wonderful introduction, but since IIT to me is family, I must say a few words about the extraordinary last six years, about what I went through and some of my feelings. In due course, once my appeal is decided, I will have a chance to tell my side of the story. While I continue to fight the injustice in my case, I have to candidly admit that I made errors and misjudgments. And for that, I take full responsibility. Up until 2011, I had the privilege of working with so many great institutions, IITs, Harvard Business School, McKinsey, Indian School of Business, Public Health Foundation, Gates Foundation, so on. They made me who I am, and I was also fortunate enough to play a leadership role that shaped many of these institutions. But most importantly, I aspired to be a role model for many of the young people who were part of these institutions who looked up to me. One of my greatest regrets is I did let them down. I want to apologize to all of you at IIT alumni that I really did not live up to the highest standards you would have rightly expected me to do. I genuinely ask for your forgiveness and understanding. I regret that five years of my life were taken away from me where I could have made hopefully many more contributions to the philanthropic causes dear to my heart in education and in health. However, I really believe that life is a series of experiences. Nothing is inherently good or bad. It is what you make of it. During this time, I saw the underbelly of our justice system, endured imprisonment and eight weeks of solitary confinement, but very importantly, got to know who my real friends are. I learned a lot and was determined to come out of this experience a better person, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. I wanted to deal with this situation with dignity, with grace, with forgiveness, with humility, without anger or bitterness. I believe the last five years has made me a better person and better able to serve the institutions I so dearly like. Now I have the privilege of introducing my friend Deepak Chopra, who of course does not need any introduction. He has been the pioneer in integrative medicine, in wellness, and personal transformation. He's the most intellectually curious person I've ever met and consistently challenges existing paradigms. 
I witnessed his own personal growth as the foremost expert in the world today of consciousness and existential questions of life. He's a prolific writer, author of 85 books, and has done more to put India's heritage, philosophic contributions, wisdom on the world stage. He brings science, the wisdom of our sages. In the fast, last few days, I finished reading this book, his latest one, You Are the Universe. I must warn you that it's a heavy reading, but does completely transform your thinking about who you are, your place in this universe. I highly recommend it. I've asked Deepak today to give us an initial talk to address his own personal journey. And one topic I think you'll find interesting as to what he thinks, what is success? What is success in this world? What is a well-led, purposeful life? And then, of course, I would like him to talk, address his latest book, which is about consciousness and the universe. Apart from all this, Deepak is a true friend. He stood by me all these 25 years through the ups and downs, and even more in the down times in the last five years. Deepak travels around the world, but he would never miss calling me when he was in the New York area to come and invite me for lunch. I was taken by the first time I went to see him in his office in ABC Carpets in, in, uh, in New York, downtown. We were going to have lunch. But he said, why don't you come and sit with me and we'll meditate for 30 minutes. And since then, we've had this tradition of off and on just sitting down, the two of us meditating. I really enjoy those moments of silence with him because it reflects to me the extraordinary friendship and the quality of this human being. Let me end by, I know Deepak would be quite familiar with this in old shlok from Rig Veda. It is a salute to the gods, but since he says you are the universe, it's quite appropriate for all of us, but even more appropriate for him. He says, Natatra Suryo Bhati Na Chandra Tarakam Nema Vidyuto Bhanti Kutoye Magni Tomeva Bhasa Sarva Midam Vibhati. Natatra Suryo, there is no sun, there is no moon, there are no stars, nor is there any lightning. So where is this light coming from? Deepak, it is your light that lights the way and shows us the way. Deepak. Thank you. Thank you. I think if someone can help us with the timer, is that timer all set? No, we don't want to go over time. Huh? OK. So um, thank you, Rajat. Uh, yes, this is an enduring friendship, and will continue to be an enduring fr friendship. And I can tell you that the secrets of a good friendship is you hold the back of your friends all the time. You accept them. You pay attention and listen to them. You express your affection, your appreciation, and you accept them exactly as they are. And that's what we do with each other. So. It's been a privilege, Rajat, to be a friend all these years. So I'm going to speak only for about 10 to 12, maybe 14 minutes, and then we can have a conversation. Rajat asked me to share my journey very quickly and where I am now in my life. I turned 70 in October, and so no matter what you do, uh, there is a time when you confront um, the end of 
your chapters. And I'm in that phase right now. Not that I'm, I'm very healthy, but um, the fact is we all, at some point, have to confront our mortality and ask ourselves, uh, what was the whole journey about? So my journey in the United States started in 1970 when I graduated from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And uh, some of you may go back that far, I don't know. Uh, I left uh, New Delhi in 1970 with $4 in my pocket because of foreign exchange regulations, if you remember. I had an uncle in London who lent me $100, so I had $108. And for those of you who are familiar with Indian mythology, 108 is an auspicious number. So I went to Paris and I spent it all in one night at the Moulin Rouge. <laughs> and when I arrived in New York, I had no money at all. We used to have those collect calls. I had made a collect call to my community hospital in New Jersey. And uh, they were so desperate, all the physicians at that time in the US were in Vietnam. So we were being recruited in a big way. Uh, they sent me a helicopter, my first experience of the United States lifting off in a helicopter looking at Manhattan and I had arrived in Wonderland. So in any case, I started an internship um, in a small place in New Jersey and uh, went on to do neuroscience, neuroendocrinology and, uh, and the study of brain chemistry in Boston with all the academic centers. And I had a couple of insights as a physician. One was that you could have two people who had the same illness. They got the same treatment, they saw the same physician, but they had completely different outcomes. So I was convinced that um, our human biology was not an algorithm. Your computers and AI and augmented reality all may be algorithms, but our biology is not, and people uh, have uh, unpredictable outcomes. So that was my first insight. And the second insight was that um, uh, because of my area of research, we were looking at molecules in the, in the brain. And the sec second insight was wherever a thought goes, a molecule follows. So this was work I was doing, but I couldn't get it published. And so one day I saw a little ad in the New York Times which said if you have $5,000, you can uh, write your own book. You can publish your own book. Manatee Press, it's called. So I published 100 copies of the first book on the um, new burgeoning area of mind-body medicine. It was called Quantum Healing, Exploring the Frontiers of uh, Mind-Body Medicine. And so even though it wasn't accepted at that time by the scientific community, it became a national bestseller, and then life took over. I didn't have any plans, but since then, it's been a very amazing journey for me so that today in academia, I think no one questions, they don't even call it mind-body connection. It's body-mind is one word, just like space-time is one word and mass energy is one word, body-mind is one word. And it's been a very interesting journey for the last 35 years because today, uh, you know, you have sciences like uh, neuroplasticity, you have epigenetics, you have the whole understanding of the microbiome, and you can see how your mind, your consciousness, your body, your environment are actually a single activity. It, they're a correlated activity. The body doesn't operate one thing at a time. Your liver, your heart, your immune system, your endocrine system, what's happening in your mind has thoughts, feelings, emotions, desires, imagination, creativity. Everything affects your body. So much so that now uh, we have had collaborations with many academic institutions where we can see that practices that are known to people who are familiar with uh, texts like the Yoga Vashishta or uh, some of the Upanishads or particularly the yogic texts, we can now document everything that happens in your body at the level of 
molecular biology, gene expression, and uh, inflammation in the body through very precise markers. So today you can, there's a science called metabolomics, where you can actually measure trillions of bits of data, trillions, not talking about billions, but trillions of bits of data. And then you have um, supercomputers help you analyze what's happening in a person's um, biology at the very fundamental levels of DNA expression, uh, transcriptome expressions, enzymes, and we have now done published work that shows that it is possible for a while to reverse human aging and the future of uh, what we call uh, well-being uh, is very good with all the devices we have, with monitoring of the brain, heart rate variability, bioregulation, virtual reality, augmented reality, all these things are coming to our aid now, so that uh, in five years from now, it's very likely, if all goes well, that you will not get a prescription, but you'll go into a studio and have a VR session to get inflammation out of your body, or you'll have a guided meditation which will change your brain waves, decrease inflammation in the body. It's come full circle. Technology has validated everything that we knew through the traditions of yoga, through, you know, if you read Patanjali's um, yoga sutras, dhyan, dharna, samadhi, yama, niyama, pratyahara, pranayam, yogasana, each of these have very precise biological correlates in our body. To the point where we have documented now in peer-reviewed journals things like uh, what happens in a week uh, in your biology through a meditation retreat, for example, or through if you go through modified forms of what was called panchakarma in India and still is called panchakarma. So there's now a science for a consciousness-based biology that looks at human aging, that looks at reversibility of disease. So I predict that in five years, um, you will have uh, medicine which is very precise, which is very personalized, which is predictable, which is preventable, which is participatory, and which is process-oriented. You have to start thinking of human biology more as an activity than as a thing. Your body is constantly recycling. So the body you're using right now uh, to listen to this lecture wasn't the physical body that you had five years ago. And that is so interesting because you can change an activity through modifying what happens in a 24-hour day. Eating, breathing, digestion, metabolism, elimination, sensory experience, thoughts, feelings, emotions, desires, personal relationships, social interactions, environment. It's one system and it's all measurable. So this is a great era for what I thought was we were pioneering in the 1970s. Uh, I and a colleague of mine who was at the NIH, we coined the word molecules of emotion, and today it's an accepted thing. So all the drugs that are actually being um, researched now are based on the molecules that your body naturally produces. Epinephrine, norepinephrine, um, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, all these molecules are actually um, the representations of what's happening in our consciousness. So as the years have progressed, not only has biology changed, where body-mind are used as one system, um, what has also changed is we are looking at a very deeper understanding of what is human experience, where does human experience happen, and how by changing experience you can change biology, and how you can use technology to take it one step further. So Rajat had asked me about you know, uh, my definition of success, because I was never looking for success, and I'm still amazed that um, every day there's a new surprise. I just <coughs> went uh, with my gut feelings. I self-published uh, my first book, and then after that, uh, you can say um, things happened very spontaneously in my life. 
I left academia many years ago in the Boston area, was associated with Harvard and Tufts and all that, because what I was saying was so controversial that uh, I had heard rumors I would be fired. So I left before I could be fired. And uh, now it's come full circle, and actually Rajat is advising me on my dialogue with many academic institutions on how we are going to go into the future of research in this area. Um, success. I think many people define success as fame, fortune, driving ambition, hard work, creativity, startups, and the like. And I've realized that that's a very important part of success. But uh, success is more than achieving your goals. In my, in my opinion, success is the progressive uh, realization of worthy goals. But it is also the ability to love, to have compassion, to cultivate deep friendships, and most importantly, to get in touch with the creativity that is inherent in your consciousness. So I'm not talking about the mind. I'm not talking about um, the intellectual process, because creativity is not an intellectual process. Creativity is going to the source of thought where it's spontaneous. And that is understanding consciousness. Therefore, for me, the highest definition of success would be to be in touch with your creative center at all times with love and compassion. That combination can almost solve any problem that you, um, that you have in society. And so that has been a passion of mine to see a uh, full circle how our ancient um, great seers talk about the four goals of life, artha, kama, dharma, and moksha. And I would say that is success, to have maximum uh, success in the material world, but also to enjoy your relationships and exercise your ability to love and have compassion and empathy and joy. And then also to see how you fit in as a human being and with the elements and forces of the universe, which is an ancient concept in our culture, which is dharma, and finally, moksha, which is the freedom from all conditioned thought. So my last book is actually about the two basic fundamental problems in science today. Number one, what is the universe made of? And without going into details, we don't know. 96% of the universe is mysterious dark energy and dark matter. 4% is atomic, but atoms are also waves of possibility. So the bottom line is the universe is made out of nothing. And the second big question in science today is, what's the basis of human consciousness? And we don't know how that happens, too, how molecules in the brain and neurochemistry generates this experience. These are huge problems in science. And unless we address these two problems, what is fundamental reality? And how is consciousness connected to that? We'll be struggling for the next few years right now with what is happening in our world. Eco-destruction, extinction of species, climate change, and all the problems that are going to come with social and economic um, injustice that is so rampant in our world. So my message to all of you, my friends, engineers, is that you're actually uh, going to have to lead this by creating technologies that harness the best creativity of our collective mind, that uh, not only enlist maximum diversity and open sources and transparency and emergence, we do have the capacity today, for the first time, despite all the problems that exist there, to create a collective consciousness through technology and through education for a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, happier, and joyful world. That's my mission at this stage in my life. And that's what I will do for the next 10 years. You realize that when you fulfill all your goals, and you have no more goals, then if you put your full attention on service, the entire world is there to uh, help you out. 
and you can harness the creativity of just about everyone. And Rajat has been a big supporter for me, and I thank you, Rajat, for that. So that's, that, that's all I had to say. We can talk. There's a mic also, but you want to start? You can. So I, I think the process would go along, so not to, uh, not to have, not utilize maximum Deepak's uh, presence here. Let me uh, start with a couple of questions. Uh, one would be, you know, in here, you have uh, engineers, scientists, people who are working on the leading edge of many of the discussions we saw in the morning, you raise a kind of a different set of issues. And a lot of it has to do with, of course, life sciences and mind and body. What do you think are the frontiers that are going to be there? You touched on it a little bit. And how can this group engage? Uh, they're much more in hard sciences, what used to be called, you know, you. <clears throat> but what's your thoughts on ideas you just started expressing, but what can this group do? How can it engage? What are the future fields? So first of all, there are many critics these days of technology, but because you know we have technologies that also create damage in the world. We've created nuclear weapons and biological warfare and cyber hacking and all of that, but technology is here to stay, I believe that it's part of human evolution. And we are at the cusp of some very major breakthroughs in technology, like voice recognition. Somebody was talking to me about that. Facial expressions, you saw the session on the actors, the, you know, the artificial animation. animation actors. So very soon, we are seeing the applications of how technology, virtual reality, augmented reality, nanotechnology, nanobots, um, and uh, bioregulation uh, or biofeedback devices, along with many other technologies that connect you to the circadian rhythms of the earth and adjust the lighting so you can reset your biological rhythms. This is going to totally revolutionize the way we do medicine. But what I'm also finding in academia is people work in their silos and they don't know what's happening outside or they're very competitive. And those of us who study emergence, we find that if you bring together a group of people from diverse disciplines, not just engineers, artists, basic scientists, consciousness experts, musicians, and microbiologists and mathematicians and neuroscientists and geneticists and microbial experts, you bring them together, you give them a task, and very soon they have a, they have a solution, a creative solution. This is the time using our technology to create those open source systems where we maximize uh, the creativity of the world. Uh, I want to take the maximum number of questions from the audience, so I'm just waiting for these cards. Can I have them? So one question is, uh, how people working with computers should increase their empathy and emotional quotient? You can send a kiss or a hug or an emoticon to somebody in <laughs> South Africa and give them an immediate dopamine hit. <laughs> actually, in our leadership training, we actually have these sessions where people come together and they harness emotional intelligence by noticing 
how they can help each other. I mean, that's the most important thing that one can do in corporate leadership is to notice people's strengths, to complement their strengths, to have shared vision, emotional bonding, and create great teams. And that's being done already in many places, those of you who know LinkedIn, Google, et cetera. This is a big part of the culture right now. So how can meditation in everyday life for an ordinary person be helpful, and what, what's your advice on that? So, you know, people have lots of misconceptions about meditation. Of course, there are hundreds of kinds of meditation, especially in the Eastern wisdom traditions, self-reflection, self-inquiry, mindfulness, awareness of body, awareness of mental space, awareness of relationships, transcendence. Let me show you something very simple, okay, uh, that you can try anytime. I'm going to ask you a question. I'd like you all to say yes as the answer. Agreed? OK, here's the question. And the answer is yes. Are you aware? Yes. A little more enthusiastically. Yes. Are you aware? Yes. OK, now, this time, I'll, I'll, of course, you're aware. Otherwise, you wouldn't answer my question. But I'm going to ask you the same question. But this time, don't answer it till I raise my hand. And then, equally enthusiastically, say yes. Are you aware? Yes. So are you aware is a thought. Yes is a thought. In between is consciousness. I'm going to ask you again. This time, don't answer it. Just slip into who's listening to me right now. Are you aware? This is meditation. To be aware of the observer in the midst of the observation is the highest intelligence. That's all. It's the presence in which all experience happens. Anytime during the day, if you get, if you get distracted anytime during the day, just ask, am I aware? And shift into the observer, which Krishnamurti used to say, to be in touch with yourself without judging yourself is the highest intelligence. Automatically, things start to shift. What happens after death? <laughs> it's a human construct. There's no such thing as death, just like there's no such thing as birth. Birth and death happen to an experience. So right now, you're having an experience, right? Five minutes ago is dead. A minute ago is dead. A second ago is dead. By the time you hear my words, what I said has happened. So the past is not here, the future is not here, and the present can't be grasped, because as soon as you grasp the present, it's over. So that's why you know the German philosopher Wittgenstein, he said, our life is a dream, we are asleep, but once in a while, we wake up enough to know that we are dreaming. And what do we wake up to? The presence, the consciousness, the awareness in which the dream is occurring. And it's not a big deal. So again, just turn your attention to that which is listening right now. See, that presence is not in time. So birth and death happen all the time, but the presence is not in time. So, I mean, that's why the Vedic Rishi said you have to realize that death only comes with the concept of birth. <clears throat> the true self is never born. You know, Bhagavad Gita, water cannot wet it, wind cannot dry it, weapons cannot shatter it, fire cannot burn it. It's ancient. It is not born, and therefore it does not die. Formless, consciousness is formless. It has no form, and yet without it, there would be no experience of form. So it's the ontological primitive. And it is not, what happens to the space if the building falls down? But what happens to two people if they are conversing on the phone and somebody cuts off the server or the lines or whatever? They're still there. So awareness, which is our fundamental state, is not in time. 
Birth and death happens through an experience, including your body, which is an experience. You had a baby's body that's dead. You had a body last year that's also gone. This is 2017 model. Every molecule in your body today, every atom in your body today wasn't there. 99.9% .9 wasn't there a year ago. Okay, so the last time I came here, I brought the same suitcase but not the same body. I mean, this is the most fundamental thing you have to realize. Your body is an activity in consciousness. It's being born and it dies all the time. But awareness itself, which is the basis of the new book also, is the ontological primitive. Just to clarify that, there are two views right now. Everything is matter and everything is consciousness. The view that everything is matter is falling apart because as you know, matter, as you chase it into the realm of subatomic um, activity, matter disappears. Uh, becomes, all particles become waves, and waves don't have mass or energy. They're just possibilities. So consciousness is a field of possibilities, which is your fundamental state. Now in, in India, in the Vedic tradition, we say jivatma. So jiva is that part of the formless ontological primitive that recycles in time as energy and information. Everything recycles, right? Molecules recycle, energy recycles, matter recycles, even plastic recycles if you leave it long enough. So consciousness also re recycles. So I have about 50 questions, so we're not going to get to all of them, Deepak, but uh, one or two last ones. Um, do you believe in the scientific method? And uh, if so, how do you apply it to validate today's world? The scientific method is based on a loop, theory, experiment, observation. Now, cosmology is done through telescopes that are out there in space, making observations that go back to the Big Bang, gravitational waves, etc. But one thing you have to realize is science is based on what is called a subject-object split. So there's me, the observer, and then there's that which is being observed. That subject-object split is artificial because the universe is a single activity. The subject-object split is a human intellectual split. That's why science can be both divine and diabolical. If you want to take science, the next step, it has to be uh, consciousness-based science, which means science and spirituality have to come together, in which case we can actually even do things we thought were impossible, like repairing the ecosystem, resurrecting dead, extinct species, etc. We need a new story for science right now. So the last question. Uh, there are lots of young people in the audience. Most, 99.9% .9 are younger than the two of us. They are beginning their journey in life, unlike where you're planning out your last 10 years, or 15, or 20, or whatever. What advice do you have to them? in terms of how they should lead their life and any thoughts on, okay, here's the wisdom of the sages coming down through Deepak Chopra. Number one, be authentic. Don't pretend to be who you're not. Number two, uh, have integrity, which means um, be true to your word. Don't make promises that you can't deliver. Number three, have a cause which is bigger than yourself. I mean, as long as you have a vision which is not about you, bigger than yourself, you will see that amazing forces come to help you. So have a vision that is bigger than yourself. And finally, um, this is an era where um, maximum diversity, strengthening the strengths, uh, complementing the strengths of others, having shared vision, connection, connecting emotionally and spiritually, you will become the entrepreneurs of the future. Because the entrepreneurs of the future are going to not be asking what's in it for me, but what can I do to help? Well, I think we are very fortunate, as all of you will agree, to have Deepak here for this session. 
Deepak, I want to really thank you for thank taking you. the time and enlightening us, and we hope you'll come back again and again. Thank you very much, Deepak. Good.